everyone. I'd like to welcome you back to Two in One Ministries. I trust that all of you had a wonderful and Merry Christmas with your families and friends. And I also wanted to wish you a blessed and happy new year. Um, today, Todd and I are going to be doing a Q&A on what is repentance and what does it mean to be born again? Because we see this as a subject matter in our world today um, where there is a lot of confusion regarding um, these um, ideas. Um, so um, as we begin, so we're just going to jump right into the lesson here. As we begin to reflect on what repentance means and the meaning of the term born again, I would like to share a small part of the vision that God gave to Paul on the Isle of Patmos. So let me tell you where that is first. Um, that is a, an island. Uh, it's a Greek island in the Aegean Sea. And it is here that God appeared to St. John to reveal the book of Revelation, which is the last book in the Bible. Um, much of the book of Revelation is actually a book of prophecy of things to come in the future. So in this passage, we see the holiness of God. This short passage that I am going to be sharing with you from Revelation chapter 1. Verses 13 through 17a. It says, And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, those are the seven churches that Paul sees in the vision, one like unto the Son of Man, that is Jesus, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and gird about the paps with a golden girdle, and that represents God's divine love for us, his head and his hairs were white like wool and white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice is the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp, two-edged sword and his countenance was like as the sun shineth in his strength and when I saw him I fell at his feet as dead so my first question that I'd like to ask you is how does each one of us compare to God's glory and holiness well, as you read about it in Revelation that we see the holiness of God and then when John, who was actually the apostle, the writer of John and 1st, 2nd, 3rd John and, and Revelation, um, when he and also walked with Jesus for three and a half years, he still saw himself as like an undone person, uh, not worthy to stand before God. And that's the way we all ought to feel. We would fall down before him and just be humiliated in ourselves because he's so much higher than we are in holiness and stuff. So the idea is that um, when we meet people in society or go knock on somebody's door and ask them, like to talk to you about Jesus or something like that, um, most people say, you know, I'm a good person, I'm all right. But when you compare their goodness to God's glory, the Bible says that Romans 3.10, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So here the best person, Gandhi, you'd probably think, or uh, Mother Teresa, you know, great people, we think of you know the things that they did, the work that they done for humanity. When they, if Christ were to stand on the scene right there in His holiness, they would they would fall down and be speechless. They they couldn't measure up. They'd fall short of His glory. So what that means is that nobody can boast and says, you know, I'm a good person. Um, I've made myself you know prepared for God. You meet Him one day. You know, I have a home in heaven. I got no uh, doubts about that and so forth. In myself, you know, I'm a good person. Um, so nobody can do that but it's only through the, the finished work of Christ actually his entire life that he lived it was sinless and then when he laid down his life it was he did an exchange he 
took upon us the iniquity, took upon himself the iniquity of us all. So then our iniquity was given to him and placed on Christ, and as with his perfect blood, as we did in our message last week, if you look at the uh, Christmas story that we gave, how that uh, we basically did an exchange with his perfect blood being untainted from going back to Adam, but he was conceived of the Holy Ghost, that that blood was perfect, sinless, acceptable unto God for sacrifice to cover sins. So when he died on the cross, he shed his blood. Then he died in our place uh, because of the ways of sin is death. And then when you apply all that to our account, then we're given his righteousness. He took away our sin debt, uh, and he took away our death penalty. And so he proclaimed this when we call on him to save him, uh, save us from our sins and repent of our sins. Then he will actually come in, receive us into himself, and then allow us to become a child of God. And because he rose again from the dead, he allows that to happen happen. Because without the resurrection of Christ, there's no salvation. If you have a dead Christ, who's got perfect works that he can apply to our sin account, perfect blood that can cover our sins, but he's dead, that would do no good. That means death would still have reign over us if, because it would reign over Christ. So therefore, because Christ rose from the dead, he conquered death, hell, and the grave. And so when with that, we can come with full assurance that we've got a Savior that will do what he says, and he has the power to do it. And he got, like it says in Revelation, he's got the keys to death and hell. So we stand before him in his righteousness, not our own. We've repented of our sins, not played games, and prayed a prayer, thinking the prayer saves us. But in fact, we're relying upon the work of prayer instead of the work of Christ. But when we rely on Christ, then he has that ability to, when we stand before him, to let us into heaven. And if you're without Christ and you die in that state, then he has the key to death and hell, and he'll open up hell for you. But it doesn't have to be that way, and he'll do it weeping because he loves you so much. So hopefully that answers the question. Um, so it's Christ that gives us salvation and uh, the righteousness to... <sighs> become more like him we won't be god but we'll be more like him in holiness it's like gold in a furnace you dig up some dirt in a mining you know pit and you find a piece of gold there with all kind of other elements on it dirt and everything you put it in that fire that's the way it is when you're first born again you're gold but you got all this impurities on you still from sin and all like that so when when you're put through the test of God's fire, of his word, you read it daily, let it burn off those things in you. You'll have to, of course, give up those things willingly. And we'll talk about it in a little bit, you know, about the uh, God gives us a will. So those are things there that, uh, in introduction, will hopefully uh, get things going in the right direction. Okay, so um, I know that the word repentance is it's a long word. It's not a word that people use a lot today. I was wondering if you could please um, give us uh, a definition that would explain the meaning of that word. Well, it's kind of like uh, if you make a, uh, a decision and then you're called down on it. You know, you see that a lot of times in sports or uh, some high-profile media person or something like that, and they're called down. They've said something wrong on Twitter that people don't like, and maybe it was their opinion that they could have said it. In America, you can pretty much say anything. Um, but then people don't like it to have freedom of speech. Um, so when they do call you down on it, you can say, well, you know, I'm sorry I said it that way. I should have said it this way, or, or I shouldn't have said anything at all. And then, um, and then you basically backtrack from what you did because you realize, yes, that was wrong. It was offensive. And that's the way it is with our sin. When we see ourselves as sinful, not this great person that God's I'm pretty lucky that I should, should be born in the world, you know, because now God has me to, uh, you know, to admire. Uh, but when we see that we're instead wallowing in the mire and see how loathsome we really are and uh, before God, then we'll be sorry for how bad the sins we've made, breaking God's laws, commandments and so forth, and then we repent. 
repentance is just turning from with sorrow and contrition uh, and with a contrite heart turning to God and from the ways that we were doing. Uh, it's kind of like if you're, if you're in New York trying to flee um, the, the government up there and all their mandates and you want to come to Florida and you come down to Florida and you um, are on 95, well, you go in the right direction. But let's say if you get off on the exit and then you go to the rest stop and all like that and then you get back on, but then you're going north not on 95. You're passing all these signs that you already just passed and uh, you're down in Georgia, for example. Uh, by the time you realize what's going on, you're, you're back up to Virginia. Okay, well, I'm supposed to be going to Florida. Well, you keep on driving and pretty soon you're back in New York. Did you repent? No, you didn't. You kept going in the same direction. Did you think about that you're going in the right direction or the wrong direction? I was going in the wrong direction. Right. So you're going in the wrong direction. You knew that, but did you repent? That's the way it is with salvation. Do you know that you're a sinner? Yes, I know I'm a sinner. Do you admit that? Yes. But you don't change anything. Did you really repent? No, you're still going to New York, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, so, yeah, hopefully that answers a little bit of the question about repentance. And that kind of leads into my next question. Um, I've met many people in my life that have um, claimed that they've uh, said a prayer, that um, they have testified that they believe that Jesus died and rose again for them, but they are still going on in a spiraling uh downhill situation with um drinking and adultery so what do you think god thinks about that well you have to ask yourself well what did the person think when he would when he asked christ to pray uh pray for salvation did he just pray to get some kind of a um put god on uh, jesus on his new god shelf or did he um uh, really understand that praying for salvation is not just saying, give me, give me, and you do nothing in return. That's what repentance is. And to follow up on that other, about repentance, in 2 Corinthians uh, 7.10, we're told that um, repentance is, uh, let's put it this way, 2 Corinthians, if you got your Bible out there, uh, 7.10, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Now, you've probably heard of people that they will keep sinning and doing whatever they're doing, whatever the vice is, until they get caught. Then they're all sorry. Why weren't they sorry before they got caught? See, when you have somebody come up to you and point out your sin, and then you're sorry, but then... As time goes on, you're still doing it. That's not sorrow. Godly sorrow, which worketh repentance, which then worketh, as the scripture says, salvation. So if you have a worldly sorrow, and you're sorry because you got caught, not because you're, you're ashamed of yourself before God, then if you have that type of, oh yeah, I'm sorry, and you know, nothing changes, then that's a worldly sorrow which still is, having you on the pathway of death. So, um, yeah, these things, um, and applying that to your question about people who uh, pray and ask for salvation, um, maybe they got saved as a little child. Um, and then they, they say, when they're like in their 20s or 30s or 50s, oh yeah, I prayed when I was six and got saved. And they're, nothing's changed. They've had two or three wives and, and uh, been in and out of jail. They're still drinking and and dealing drugs and uh, or cheating uh, their company or whatever it is, they didn't truly get saved because you will then have repented with a godly sorrow and you had been seeing sin as exceedingly sinful and you'd be wanting to please God rather than yourself. So I think that uh, in the way of somebody who asked if, if Christ will save them, they're forgetting the fact that Jesus is to be Lord and Savior, not just Savior. 
So if you're having Christ as your Lord and you're filled with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit should be telling you as you um, hopefully will be reading your Bible that those things that you read, like Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. So if you keep your you keep the commandments of Christ, then that's what will be a proof positive that you're born again. It's not that keeping commandments will save you, but keeping commandments will evidence that you're saved. Uh, like if you walk up to, a, you see a tree off in the distance, you can't quite make out its leaves, but and there's no fruit on it yet, you don't know what type of tree it is. That's the way people are. You look at them from a distance, you don't really know what type of person they are. But if you see fruit in their lives, uh, like you'd see oranges on a tree and off in the distance, you say, oh, that's an orange tree. You look at a Christian who's living in carnality, which is an oxymoron, but um, and at a distance, you'd say, that person's not a Christian. So therefore, you're having a bad testimony. You're not... Um, obviously fulfilling the, the Great Commission because you're you're being like the world. Nobody can tell you you're a Christian. And even if you were explaining to people about how to be saved, does your life even, does your life back it up or does it life like uh, ridicule you? Like, remember when Lot told his uh, fellow citizens in the, in the land of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, he said, come flee this place. And they, and they just laughed at him. Are they laughing at you or are they believing you? So, um, of course, you won't be able to convince everybody because Noah preached for 120 years and, and nobody came but his wife and three sons and their wives. Okay, I think those are some really important um, points that you made. Um, can you be a little more specific on my question with um, the passage in Galatians that um, Paul shares with us about Specifically, what are some of those um, lust of the flesh that trip us up and distract us from um, true repentance? Well, see, when we're born, we're born as a sinner. It's natural for a person to sin. You don't have to teach a child to go and steal a cookie or lie to uh, his parents because, you know, uh, he doesn't want to get in trouble or whatever. But so it's natural to do these things. That's why you have to be born again, because you have to overcome these things. And Galatians 5, uh, 5 19 through 21 tells us what these works are that are of the flesh. And it says uh, uh, that, uh, that there are these, uh, it's adultery, fornication, uncleanness. It's not talking about, you not taking a bath in a while. Uh, it's talking about just your lifestyle. Uh, lasciviousness, which is exceedingly seeking after lustful things, even to the demise of yourself, in disregard of whether man or God thinks anything about you. You just think, well, don't judge me. You know, that's lasciviousness. Idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, which is like people going around stirring up trouble, nib-nosing, that type of thing. Uh, keep that in mind, too, when you do reviews online or go online, talk about this person or this, you know, all that's falling in line with this, variance. Uh, narcissism, which is what emulation is, which is like depressing others to make yourself feel good. Um, heresies, believing or teaching things that are not biblical, according to God's word. Um, envyings, you know, just being jealous of other people. You know, we got that problem in America. Uh, got to have a one-up on everybody. So I think that's why America's so much in debt right now. Um, then you got this thing of uh, murders. Murder rates up. Um, drunkenness, revelings. It's like living in a pagan lifestyle. You can just think of like uh, Mardi Gras. You know, just, they revel all week, committing all this stuff we just mentioned. Then they go to the priest and confess their sin. I think that that's it. You know, I'm good now. Uh, and such of this, of the like, uh, the which I tell you, as I said before, as I have told you in times past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So if you do these things, then that's what, you know, the Bible says, that you will not inherit the kingdom of God. But I prayed a prayer when I was, doesn't matter if, if you do these things, that's pertaining to somebody who's 
living a lifestyle of these things. Uh, drunkenness, murderings, adultery, and those type of things. Uh, then, you know, that's indicative that you never got saved. You never were sorry for your sins. You just took the blood of Christ and just trampled on it. Thought it is nothing. Uh, but when you truly do see the value and the sacrifice that Christ did to save you and everyone else, all of us wretch, wretched people, then uh, we would repent. We'd see the value of it, that he bought us from the slave market of wickedness, and he bought us to free us, not to go run around and keep doing these same things, but to then serve him and get rewards for it and be a blessing to other people and all like that. Um, and then also John the Baptist instructed us uh, that we should be, uh, for us to be saved, we have to be repenting uh, from our old lifestyle and habits and embrace the gospel. Uh, of course, he saw the Pharisees coming to him and he's, and they said they wanted to be baptized. And he says, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come uh, repent? You know, And so uh, those are type things that we need to, that's why we've got to read the Bible so we can feed ourselves. That way you can do your own program. If you don't like ours, just, <laughs> you can make your own and we'll watch yours and uh, hopefully it'll be a blessing to us. Uh, but we, we've got us, in order to turn this country around, as we gave this message here a few months back about how can we save America, I think it was, it, it, you just got to figure this is the only way. You've got to come from a spiritual level, not from a political level, although that does play into it after you get the spiritual level taken care of. Once everybody's born again, serving Christ, ridding themselves of all this um, fruit of the sin nature, then uh, we can build this country back up again. But if we build it up on financial wealth and like that, and everybody's still a big pagan running around killing each other and, and uh, hopping in bed with everybody that they shouldn't be, then we're going to continue down this slide of, towards uh, Sodom. So, um, hopefully that answers. <laughs> Thank you. Um, at this point, um, I hope that people will hang in here with us uh, because I know that you're going to be um, sharing a little passage here on your phone um, in answer to my next question. Um, so what I would like for you to do is, can you give me a Bible example of a person who was living in darkness and, you know, out doing like some of these lust of the flesh that you just mentioned, like out killing people and then he sincerely got repented and saved and and turned his life around can you give me an example of that please mm, not offhand not a kid. <laughs> um, well we see that in the book of acts 9 uh, 1 through 22 there's a man that was persecuting the church his name was Saul and in fact he was there collecting the coats of those that uh, when everybody stoned Stephen, who was a godly man, you know, he was one of the um, one of the first deacons. And so he was stoned, and he cried out to the Lord, you know, uh, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And there over from him was Saul, a persecutor of the church. And so he was, uh, the background of it was that he was on his way to Damascus with letters from the high priest, to go around with more Christians to bring them back and imprison them and probably put them to death and all like that. So while he was on the way there, this is where we get this um, next segment. And uh, we'll let this, since it's a lengthy read, be read to you. And Saul, so, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired him letters to Damascus to the synagogues that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth, and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, and Jesus, whom thou persecutest, it is hard for thee to kick against the bricks. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, 
and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. But they led him by the hand, and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he prayeth. And hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in, and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way, and entered into the house, and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus, and straightway he preached Christ in the synagogue, that he is the Son of God. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on this name in Jerusalem, and came hither for that intent that he might bring them bound unto the chief priests? But Saul increased the more in strength, and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. Okay, so as you can see, that Saul had a conversion. He was hating Christ and the people who worshipped Christ, and then when he was converted, which is the repentance and salvation, and the result of that was that he did what they did. He wouldn't preach Christ. So, is your life doing that? Have you made a such a turnaround that you've forsaken all and taken up your cross and followed Christ? Thank you for sharing that. I really like that passage because um, Saul's physical blindness, I believe God allowed him to experience that to show him his spiritual blindness because before he got saved, and truly repented. Um, he was actually thinking he was doing God a service, going around killing and persecuting these Christians. And then afterwards, he became this great missionary and wrote several books of the Bible and, um, and was willing to endure a lot of those same persecutions that he was giving out um, himself before he was converted. So uh, my next question is, um, how would you say that both repenting from sin and believing in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is God, affected Saul's life later, especially um, as he was renamed Paul? Well, as we see from those scriptures and all throughout his writings and in the book of Acts and so forth like that, this his experience produced salvation, which then resulted in changes in his life. His mindset, his attitude, his goals, his thoughts towards himself. He didn't mind getting shipwrecked or beaten for Christ's sake because he didn't sit there and say, oh, poor me. But uh, he took it as an honor to have those things done against him. So he changed his, his uh, attitudes and his uh, hate towards Christians and so forth to where he wanted to uh, 
align himself with him and identify himself with him and receive, you know, um, the fruit of the Spirit in his life and demonstrate that towards others. And the Holy Spirit working through his life and as a result of his obedience and change, uh, Christians throughout history since then has been affected by his obedience. So I guess the question is, are you affecting people in the way of obedience unto Christ or obedience to stay into the world and obeying the God of this world? So. And that's a good question too because God tells us that um, we're either on one side or the other, that either Satan's our master and we're living in those lusts of the flesh or Jesus is our Lord and master and we're living according to the fruits of the Spirit. So that brings me up to my next question, which is about the fruits of the Spirit. Um, what are the fruits of the Spirit that demonstrate this sincere repentance that we've been talking about and that Paul habitually practiced? Can you explain those, please? And there again, you have to keep going back to the scriptures. The God's authority is, is the final authority, and it's that what we go by. And so... Um, Galatians 5, 22 through 25 teaches of what the fruit of the Spirit is. As our study that we did uh, a couple years ago, if you go to our YouTube channel, uh, you can go on the far right side, there's a, there's a little, barely you can see it as a little uh, hourglass, not hourglass, magnifying glass. You click on it, and there's a little line comes open. You can actually type in a, a title or, you know, a keyword, and it'll pull up those topics, like uh, study on the Holy Spirit. Or fruits of the fruit of the spirit, stuff like that. So you can actually find some of the studies we did on the Holy Spirit. But uh, what Chuck Smith, who is going by using his book, he referred to the uh, people say it's the fruits of the spirit, but actually it's the fruit of the spirit. And it's basically one fruit with many at, um, facets on it, and those facets would be having a, a demonstration of love, joy, peace, long suffering. Goodness, gentleness, faith, meekness, temperance, which is self-control. Of course, being self-controlled by the Spirit of God, against such things there is no law, and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh and the affections thereof, and the lusts of it, um, by those uh, facets, those aspects of the fruit of the Spirit. It says if we live in the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit also. So if we're saved, we ought not be walking out of the course of this world, another scripture says. So um, that's one thing we ought to strive to do, is, especially in this day and hour, with um, so much coming down through the news and everything like that, we got to have the fruit of the Spirit. Otherwise, we just, we just become um, you know, like salt that's lost its savor. What good are you if you don't demonstrate faith and meekness and gentleness and kindness and love and all like that? You just like the world, and so your testimony is shot. Um, so, thank you. That was a good point. Um, you know, I have some friends and family members that claim Christianity, but I do not see the Holy Spirit conviction over sin in their lives. So, how can I be assured that they will go at the rapture? Yeah, it's a hard thing because on the one hand, the scripture says that we're told not to quench the Holy Spirit. Quench not the Spirit. Um, so the Spirit of God can actually be telling you, don't do this, but you can actually just ignore the Spirit of God, which is not wise. Um, so you can quench Him. It's like if you have a fire and you want to put it out, you just throw water on it and you quench it. Well, we can, through our disobedience and not hearing what the Spirit of God says and following through, then we can quench it. But then what that does, it continues to dull us down to what he has to tell us. So uh, a Christian, if he were to be truly saved and quenching the Spirit of God like that, may find himself eventually dying because First John in there, it talks about that there is a sin unto death. So there may be something that you could do, but if I go and do it and do it and ignore the Spirit of God, he may allow me to just be taken out because I'm, I'm making a mockery of God in his name. So it's very, um, very uh, shifting sand and bad place to be at in your life if you're ignoring the Spirit of God. And especially if you're not saved and you're, 
you're ignoring the Spirit of God on the outside because the Spirit of God is there knocking, trying to get your attention to say, hey, you're, you're not a believer. Um, you got this in your life, this in your life. And, but you can receive Christ repenting of your sin and be saved. And if you're ignoring, ignoring the Spirit of God, then that, that's also uh, that's very bad. And, of course, people in that condition, they're not going to be able to go up in the rapture. And you kind of wonder about the people who are saved claiming they're saved. We don't know that they're saved. You can only go by what somebody says. But you can also inspect their fruit. Are they truly born again? So we can deceive ourselves. Um, we can believe Satan's lies because it talks about that we're uh, deceiving and being deceived. We can deceive others, and then we can be deceiving ourselves too. And it talks about how that uh, uh, we need to be guarded against deception, like being self-deceived, uh, not to accept. You know, we can receive another Jesus. We can be deceived in that, like people in cults. Uh, got Jehovah Witnesses, Mormons, so forth like that. They have another Jesus. Not the true Jesus, but it's another one. Uh, or you can receive another gospel, uh, which it tells you about, oh, yeah, you can be saved and trust in Jesus. And uh, But, you know, the Buddhist and you, he has his, and Jesus spoke to them too. And uh, so, you know, so you can actually receive a um, social gospel or some kind of ecumenical gospel. And it's not truly based on faith in the Son of God. It's based in faith of uh, human reasoning and uh, another gospel. So we find this warning in 2 Corinthians 11, 3 and 4, where it says, But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve, or deceived her, through his subtlety, that your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you received another spirit, which you have not received, or another gospel, which you have not accepted, you might very well with him. Um, then in 3 and, uh, 13 and 14 it says, uh, For such are false apostles, I mean, people coming to you, um, for such a, a false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ, and no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. And some people have unknowingly placed, replaced true worship of Jesus for the love of money, uh, or some of people have even uh, exchanged proper living moral standards, uh, such as like living with somebody. Say, well, we love each other. God understands. Uh, we've actually, you know, had a ceremony before God, and uh, and all that stuff. Um, if you're not married before God, in at least the presence of a justice of the peace and, a, and another witness, then uh, that's deception, and it's living as according to what we saw, the fruit of, of uh, sin, which is including there the fornication. So this is not characteristic of, of true salvation. Um, you ought to be having, as the old saying used to go when I was younger, you know, they taught you should have like a little red flag coming up that the Spirit of God sends up into your soul, into your heart. You know, that's wrong uh, based on the scriptures. Now, the government won't mind if you live together. That's fine and like that. But um, you can't claim that when you stand before God. So those type of things there, bondage, put you in deception and darkness and emptiness. That's why there's so much hopelessness nowadays, and especially with the last couple of years ago when they did all the lockdowns, people were getting depressed and getting suicidal and all like that because, you know, they were living outside of the their own abilities to handle things. But with Christ, you have all ability when you're truly saved to, to do more and be more than conquerors for Christ. Um, so... Okay, that gives some understanding to it. Thank you. And before I move on to my next question, can you just reiterate um, the idea of Luke 13, verse 5 again? Uh, yeah, that's the one where it talks about uh, Jesus was saying about um, the people asked Jesus about as they went by the uh, Tower of Siloam, and he said, Do you think those people were 
more wicked than these others? And, and so his answer was, uh, well, those on whom the tower of Siloam fell and slew them, um, thinking they are sinners above those all that dwell in Jerusalem. But verse 5, Jesus said, I tell you, nay, except that ye repent, ye shall likewise perish. So apparently he was comparing them to some pretty bad dudes out there, you know. And he says, you thought they were bad. you got to repent, otherwise that's going to happen too. So those are things that, that Jesus takes a pretty uh, strong stand against sin and a positive stand towards repentance. My next question is, thank you for clarifying that. Um, do you think that these end times that are unfolding, especially as we see um, not just trouble here in the USA, but it's pretty much in every country across the world right now, do you think that has anything to do with a lack of repentance or, in other words, um, a lack of sincere sorrow over sin and looking to Jesus Christ for salvation? Yeah, they're just... Uh doing everything they can to not be obedient to Christ, which is repentance, receiving salvation, and so forth. So according to 2 Timothy uh, 3, 1 through 5, um, Paul warns us, as he's telling Timothy, he says, specifically know this, that in the last days, perilous times shall come, where men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, pro uh, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection. That'd be like a man being attracted to a woman. They don't have that affection. That's unnatural. Or a woman not wanting to have any children, you know, because she likes her freedom. Being a liberated woman. Uh, it's unnatural for a woman not to have children. Truce breakers. That'd be like people make an agreement and they break it off. Like, they're married, now they won't be married anymore. Uh, False accusers, incontinent, people that's out of control. See that a lot nowadays, people just murdering because they're out of control. They don't have the ability to pull themselves together uh, and do what's right, biblically. Fierce, despisers of those that are good. Uh, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. So that's what we're told. If you hang out with people that are like this crowd, you'll become like them. As it says in, I think it's Proverbs, where he says, Go thou not with an anger man, lest thou learn his ways and become like him. You can put in an angry man and put in uh, a murderer, a thief, a drunkard. You'll be just like him. See, um, what is it? Uh, birds of feather flock together. I was going to say thieves of feathers. <laughs> but yeah, so these are things that we need to remember. We got to do things God's way as an individual, as a community, as a country, as a world. Otherwise, we're going to have all this stuff continually bringing us down to uh, eventually uh, death's door, uh, as uh, we see. But his love, God's love for us, allows us to choose his way or reject it. And people say, well, why did God allow for that person to kill that little girl or or uh, kidnap and put her into a uh, sex trade or like that. Well, God allowed it because he gives you a free will. Just like, you know, you're probably already thinking, okay, this guy, he doesn't know he's talking about his wife. Um, so you, that's your free will. Uh, and that's what these people do. They choose what they want, right and wrong. Um, so God makes us with a free will. And so that's what we're calling on you uh, even now to make a decision. Do you want to continue in the way in this new year doing things same old, same old? Or do you want to have like a new norm being God's norm? <laughs> okay, my next question is, thank you. Um, could God forgive and save anyone from a lifestyle of participating in witchcraft or abortion? Well, yeah, yeah. Because uh, God, he says his hand is not too short that he cannot save. And so he can be able to save to the uttermost. And some people say the gutter most. Uh, but Romans 5, 8 through 11 explains, but God commended or showed to us his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, God 
basically means uh, looks at us at the time of our salvation as though we've never sinned. Basically, like a full pardon, um, not holding our sin against us anymore. And we shall be saved from wrath through him, from God's wrath. Uh, for when, if we were, when we were enemies of God, we were reconciled to God by the death of the Son. How much more being reconciled should be, we be saved by his life? So God loved us and allowed for his Son to be killed to bring him to himself. So now that the Son's alive, he's saying, how much more shall God do for us because Christ is alive and, and uh, the wrath is, is past? Um, so <clears throat> he says, uh, he says, by whom then through Christ Jesus we have the atonement. Atonement is a covering. And people, for some reason, don't like that in the New Testament. Atonement. But atonement's good because that's Old Testament Christ fulfilled that Old Testament requirement of atonement, which basically, uh, if you break it down, is atonement is at one minute. If you look at it like that, at one minute. So we're at one with God now, whereas before we were enemies. Um, if you were angry at your brother and you made up and you draw a truce, you're at one now. Um, so that's the way we are with God once you get saved. Um, and you can see on YouTube and various places of all the various ones that's gotten saved out of witchcraft and um, adultery and uh, all these other things. Uh, maybe they had abortion or two or something like that, and they realize, hey, that's murder. So then they basically do like every murder has done. David murdered, was responsible for murder. Uh, even uh, these others throughout history that um, have committed murder, uh, been on death row. They've received Christ many times. And, of course, that's who Christ came to save. Uh, they're sinners. Right? So, um, 2 Peter 3, 9 shows us that God is not willing that any should perish. Um, talking about eternally in the lake of fire, but that we should all instead come to repentance. So God doesn't will that you should die, no matter if you've you know, been in war, killed a lot of people, you know, for a country or whatever like that. Or maybe if you're just a serial killer, you know, and just did it for your own purpose. Uh, God has the ability to save, which is seems amazing, you know, how did, why would he do that? Well, because he loved us. And so, um, I guess, moving on to here, because we're running short on time, but... Yes, one last do, question. Uh, one we, last question, uh, yeah. It's, um... It's about the term born again. Um, my last question is, did Nicodemus, who was one of Jesus' followers, um, ask him about being born again? And what does born again mean? How did Jesus explain that to him? Uh, Nicodemus asked, can I go back into my mother's womb? So Jesus said, no. He says, uh, you know, basically you have to go and uh, be... Uh, born again, which describes us as uh, having two births. One is everybody has, you know, you birth through your mother, have her uh, water breaks, and then when she gets birth, that births you out of her womb. Uh, so that's one water birth. And then the second one that's more important, the water of, um, which is um, born of the Spirit. So that's where we are birthed out of this world and this uh, grip on us. We're birthed from the family of Satan into the family of God. And it's not baptism. is not salvation, the second water. Um, but it's just that when we are saved, that's the second birth where we get repent of our sin, repent truly, and then call on Christ to save us. Being sorry that we had other gods in our place, in the place of God, the Father. And um, and then we're born into God's family. And then uh, salvation is including uh, the setting us free from darkness, uh, repenting, giving up the lust of the flesh. And then we believe in Christ as God and our Savior and Lord. And not just putting them on the God shelf and being like all the other gods. Um, and then John 14, 6, Jesus says to uh, them, 
or to him, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me or by me. So uh, with this, you know, you can invite Christ into your heart. And uh, you maybe already been, been saved listening to all this. That's what it was with Cornelius. Peter was preaching, and all of a sudden Cornelius and his family believed, and they were saved. Boom, just like that, because they had that inner uh, conviction and contrition and uh, repentance and called upon Christ internally. They believed, and that's what it is. You switch from one belief system to the next. And and you don't vacillate back and forth. I mean, if you truly repent, you won't go back. So he came to set us free from sin, Satan, the lake of fire, and all those things, uh, to give us a life of love, joy, peace, long suffering, and all the fruits of the Spirit. Um, so you can actually call on Christ today and ask Him to save you. If you just uh, look at it like this, you can say a prayer simply as this: uh, You can say, Lord Jesus, I'm ashamed and sorry for my sins. Please help me to turn away from Satan and sin and cleanse me with your perfect sinless blood. I believe that you died and rose again for me. And please take my soul to heaven when I die. And I commit to letting you be Lord over my life and every part of my life. I repent of my sinful self and believe in your Holy Spirit power that you save me now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So that was your prayer. Hopefully uh, any minute you can leave us a little note there. And if you're one of these that, you know, don't believe in God, I got hopefully these are little steps that's bringing you closer to uh, that reality. That yes, there's a God. And uh, one thing to people say, well, how can you show proof of there's a God? I'll give you one word to show the proof of God. Israel. And with that, we'll close. We'll see you next time. Thank you for watching. And uh, subscribe. And see you next time.